Today's podcast is sponsored by The Morning Navigator, a daily newsletter written by Tony Greer, who is a 30-year veteran trader in the financial markets. I think it's important to be responsible with your personal finances and investments, and it's hard to do that without understanding the markets. Now this is where The Morning Navigator fills a specific need for me. If you're looking for actionable trade ideas or simply to educate yourself about the markets, then The Morning Navigator will help you to do both. It's an interesting, informative, and amusing daily read. Now, a subscription to The Morning Navigator normally costs $60 a month or $650 per year. However, my listeners can go to tgmacro.com, sign up for a free one-week trial, and apply the code ZUBY, Z-U-B-Y, at checkout for a discount of either $10 off the $60 a month subscription or $100 off the $650 annual subscription. As you can infer, the annual subscription is a better deal. Either one is a win when it comes to understanding the global markets and managing your personal investments. So once again, you can sign up today for a free trial at tgmacro.com. tgmacro.com. Go check it out. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now on today's episode, we are going to be talking about fitness. We're going to be talking about functional fitness. We're going to be talking about nutrition. We're going to be talking about body weight training. And who better to do that with than with my friend, Jerry Teixeira. Welcome to the show. What's going on, Zuby? I'm all blessed, bro. How are you? Good, man. Good. I'm alive, so can't complain. Yeah, man. Every day is a blessing. So yep. I've done a super brief intro right there, man. Um, but let the people know a little bit more about who you are. So I've been involved in um, being physically active in fitness since I guess I was 18. I went into the Marine Corps and obviously very physical culture. And then <clears throat> when I got out, uh, I continued to lift. I went to basically you know normal gym like most people would. Mm-hmm. And after about five years of getting out of the Marine Corps, we had a child, my wife and I. And the first year and a half after we had a kid, it was extremely challenging to get to the gym um, just because life changed. And I, I got pretty fat. And so I was 50 pounds overweight, like a 40-inch waist um, at 5'8". Mm-hmm. And... I'd never had a problem with my weight Mm -hmm. until that happened. And so um, what I ended up doing was finally getting back to the gym, you know, dialing everything down, losing weight over time. Um, And, but, but I continued to train just like standard weight training, like most people would think of when you, when you think about fitness. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years after my daughter was born, we had our second child, which was my son. And going into it, I already knew I was probably going to have a hard time getting to the gym from past experience. Okay. And so I decided I was going to train at home. And that way I would still be able to keep my routine and not have the same thing happen to me that happened the first time around. Um, But when I decided I was going to train at home, I was also feeling kind of burned out with just so many years of going to the gym. And so I decided that I wanted to try to do more of a, a body weight approach And what spurred me to think that I could do that was my daughter at this point, we put her in gymnastics and she was in gymnastics for seven years at this point. And so she had become competitive and getting, moving up the level. So I was exposed to some higher level um, gymnastics, you know, male and female athletes and coaches, and they have incredible physiques and they don't lift. Mm. And so I kind of thought to myself, I wonder if I could obviously not do like high level gymnastics or anything like that. But looking at their conditioning and their strength training, I thought, man, I wonder if I can get into that type of calisthenics and, you know, basically train at home that way for a while, then eventually go back to traditional lifting. Mm -hmm. And so what I found is I I basically planned out what I was going to do and bought a bunch of books, blogs, you know, YouTube. I, I basically learned as much as I could in anticipation of my son being born. And then I canceled my gym membership and started training at home uh, with progressive body weight. And the thing that happened for me, at least, is that it was just really fun and it was a new challenge. Yeah. And so when I did that, I found myself really enjoying the training and not wanting to go back to the gym. And so that is kind of where I devoted myself to you know, the, the body weight strength methodology versus going back to traditional lifting. But I always try to make clear to people, I don't think it's better than a standard gym. Mm -hmm. Basically, physical activity and building strength in whatever manner you choose is hugely beneficial. And so what I try to teach people or make people realize is that 
when I was in the Marine Corps, we did calisthenics to build endurance. It was not thought of as strength training, sure. right? You do build a small amount of strength, but, and so that was my mentality toward it. And then much later, when I looked at gymnasts, I realized they take body weight training or calisthenics and they do it as a methodology to build strength. Mm. So you can build real strength without weights or you can use it to build endurance. But for most people, when they think about body weight training, they think about endurance. They think P90X or insanity. Yeah, yeah. They don't look at it as a way to build strength. And so that's kind of what the core of my content is teaching people to use it to actually build real functional strength, not endurance, so to speak. Awesome. Awesome. So now with your training, are you, are you now 100% body weight training now? Yeah, I've been since it all. when my son was born, I switched to basically the, the calisthenics based stuff. Okay. And I have a buddy that we work together a couple days a week. And on the days we work together, I would go hit a quick workout after work and then come okay. home. And that was for a couple months after my son was born. And then we stopped working together and I dropped it at that point. So it's been four plus four and a half years or so. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm just doing pure hundred percent body, body weight. Yeah. And, and the thing is I, I will probably at some point <laughs> add back in a weighted hip hinge. Mm -hmm. I've been eyeing some kettlebells, but the thing is for me, at least I, I can't do an iron cross yet. I have a straddle planche, not a full planche. If anybody's curious about those, you can Google them, but they're very advanced body weight strength elements mm. or gymnastic <laughs> strength elements. And, um, until I get those things down, cause I mark those out as goals. Yeah. I probably won't go back to you know, a, a traditional or adding in any traditional strength training just because I've, I've only got so much time to train. That's awesome, man. I mean, one thing that's really been interesting, of course, as we are recording this video, we are on coronavirus lockdown. So a lot of people, including myself, don't have gym access right now. Um, so it's been, a, it's been interesting for me because one thing I've learned, and this has been super duper humbling, and this is that I suck at body weight training right? Someone might like see me, I mean, com compared to, you know, the average totally sedentary person, right? Like the, I, some of the stuff I can do probably looks somewhat impressive, but especially with like the lower body stuff, like I cannot do a pistol squat. I was, <laughs> I was attempting to do them this morning. I was like, holy crap. Like considering how strong I am on like my like, deadlifts and squats and all this, I was like, my body was just getting, getting fried by trying to do these movements that it had never, it never really done before. You know, it's just like totally different movement patterns. So one interesting thing I'm already learning is one, you know, that, that sort of level of humility, because you get to a certain level of strength doing certain movements and certain exercises, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to carry over to something that you haven't done before. But also just thinking like, you know what, lots of this stuff I want to start incorporating into my, you know, normal training. Like I love lifting weights. I love pumping iron that that's not going to stop, but right. okay. I should certainly be supplementing some of this with more of these, uh, with more of these exercises. Cause I'm kind of like, man, at the level of strength and, you know, number of training years I have under my belt, some of these movements I should really be, I should really be able to do. So during this lockdown period, I myself, am going to be, you know, trying to focus on Trying, trying to hit, trying to hit some of these, uh, trying to hit some of these things properly. So I've been learning the progressions, going back a few steps, and it's interesting because it's it's a little bit like being a being a complete noob again. Yeah, that's honestly what what appealed to me was a deadlift is a deadlift for twenty years, no matter mm. how long you train for. Mm. A bench press is a bench press, and you progressively and we can dig into this, but you progressively overload in your training if you want to keep making progress. So you mm. have to be either adding another two and a half pounds or five pounds or whatever the case is over time. And, but I started to get where I felt like when I was going to the gym and I probably similar to you where I, I really do like my training time mm -hmm. because with wife and kids and everything else, that's, that's my me time. I don't want gym partners. I don't like working out with people on a regular basis. Same. It, it's like my sanctuary, you know, mm -hmm. but I was getting to where I still needed that, that time but I wasn't enjoying the actual lifting as much anymore. Not that I didn't want the exercise, but I, I was kind of stagnant. And so when I made the switch to calisthenics, like you're saying, I was terrible. <laughs> I looked at, dude, I sucked yeah. and, and I wasn't weak, you know? So yeah, I, yeah, but I looked at, thing. and so I'm like Googling these guys, I'm, I'm looking at gymnasts and I'm like, holy crap, how in the hell? Like yeah. I'm looking at, and, and not again, not doing flips or any of the, the skills, 
I'm talking about basic strength elements in gymnastics. These guys are doing these things on rings mm -hmm. or they're doing like these, these handstands. And I'm thinking, dude, that's insane. Mm -hmm. Like, and I, I was so far away from being able to do any of that, that I think something about just being the type of individual where I like a challenge. Yeah. I was like, dude, I'm terrible. So I'm, I'm going to not be terrible at this. And yeah, so yeah. the challenge of it is like, I, I could barely do a one arm push up, and it was disgusting looking. Dude, and I was I'm, like, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to hit that now. Like I'd never even attempted it before. That's the thing. Yeah, exactly. Right? I almost, I almost like just assumed with like, okay, I can bench this muscle. I can probably do a one arm push up. And then I was like, I actually try it. And then it's like, you know, like, so yeah, I you, fall you face first on the ground. I'm like, holy, like, this is crazy. It's like, and it's weird. Cause like psychologically, like physiologically, I know I have the strength to do it. Right. Right. It's like exactly. Absence of strength. Even it's just like, my body is not trained for this pattern. Like I've just never, ever done this before. Like my chest is strong enough. My core is strong enough, but I need to learn how to balance myself and how to just learn this motor pattern. Exactly. It's that, neuro, that neuromuscular adaptation that yeah. has to happen. And that, that's yeah. why if you, so if you're listening to this and you're somebody who has a history of, of physical training, mm. then you will be able to make the adaptations more quickly. Cause to your point, it's not that your muscles aren't strong enough. It's that you just are not used to training that particular pattern. Mm. And so your progress will probably come more quickly uh, than somebody who has not trained in the past. Um, but it is, there's definitely a, fun factor that I think just to give you an example, most people have not done a handstand since they were 10 years old or nine years old or whatever. Yeah. And so when you decide, okay, I'm going to try a handstand, it, there's just something kind of fun mm. about, or like a pistol squat, right? So you're like, Oh, I'm going to try this fall over. Um, and, <laughs> and you're like, what you're the heck? You're describing my morning. <laughs> but then there's something, there's something in, in your brain that kind of clicks and you're like, I could do this. Like yeah. I'm going to do this, you know? Yeah. So if you're stuck, which most people are on some, some type of quarantine right now, it, it, I think at that now more than ever, some type of physical training is super important mm. just because, you know, we, we, whether you believe we were created or evolved or whatever, we've been a physical species since as for as long as we've been here. Yeah. And so when you can barely leave your house, you are most likely less physical than at any point ever. Mm. And so I, I think it's super important to add back, make sure you add in some kind of activity and i think right now it's the, everybody's routines if your routine was the gym every morning or every evening or whatever or three days a week mm -hmm. that's all out the window yep. and so what what i think is cool is if you just say okay i'm going to do a bunch of push-ups and then a bunch of body weight squats it can get really boring very quickly yes and so you know I mean, I could do it. I think I, I stopped because I got so bored. I did like 70 something squats for a mm -hmm. video once okay. and it, it was like seven minutes. I'm still squatting <laughs> after seven minutes yeah. and it was to illustrate a point. Now, if I go do a pistol squat, even if you, if you can't do a pistol squat, you can use your hands to hold on to something to stabilize you yeah. and do an assisted single leg squat, which is still, which is still hard by the way, dude, it's brutal. It's it, 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 <laughs> most people will fail at five or six. Yeah. And so that, that's my whole point is that you can scale body weight training to be rather than a 70 squat endurance session. Mm -hmm. You can scale it to where you're failing at seven per leg, for example. Yeah. And it's the same thing with pushups or with, with whatever else. So if you're, if you're, missing the gym and you're itching to get back, but this is going to go on for however long it's going to go on for. I encourage you to look at scaling the intensity of what you're doing because number one, it will be more effective from, from a strength building standpoint. But number two, you're probably going to suck at it and it's going to mm. click and you're going to think, Oh, okay, I got a challenge. I could do this. And at least for the next six weeks or whatever, however long this lasts for, at least you have something that calls to you to get better at. Yep. versus just doing the regular push-ups, which are, they're fine. They're fine. But just doing regular push-ups, it just gets boring. Yeah. And that's one of the complaints I hear from people like, okay, I'm, for, I'm doing a hundred squats and a hundred push-ups and a hundred yeah. whatever. And there's just no, you know, when you set your mind on, I'm going to bench 315 and you've got this goal. Mm. So if you're just doing a bunch of push-ups and regular body weight squats, there's just not a goal. It, yeah. it, you're just going through the motions for most people. So, yeah, yeah. and also once, you know, and if you're uh, you know, um, intermediate or advanced, um, athlete. It also, it, it, it's interesting for me. It's been interesting for me sort of seeing that, seeing the sort of, the sort of jump. So like, you know, pushups, it's like, yeah, I can, I can knock out, a, you know, a good number of pushups or whatever. Like that's sure. not, that's not a challenge, but then 
you know, I, I started trying doing the, you know, having one, one hand elevated, one hand on the floor and, you know, moving that out. And I was like, okay, okay, I'm starting to, I'm starting to like feel that properly now, right? I can't just keep going and going and going. And then, you know, right. eventually, you know, I plan to eventually get to the, to the one arm ones and everything. And yeah, it's been interesting just having to, having to totally rethink things differently and see, oh, okay, like you can do all of these body weight squats. Like maybe you can knock out, I don't know, a hundred plus body weight squats, but can you do one pistol squat? Right. And I, right. I, yeah. I learned for myself, the answer is no. Right. Cause as soon as I tried it, I was like, Oh, I was, I was watching videos online of people doing it. I was like, Oh, okay. Like, you know, you watch it and it looks, it looks relatively easy. It's just like, okay, yeah, of course I can do that. Like I can, I can squat a good amount. Like my legs are strong, whatever. And then you try to do it and you kind of reach that halfway point and your body's just like, Nope, Nope, Nope. <laughs> if you go any lower, you are going to fall over and you try to go lower, boom, fall over. And so, yeah, it's been, um, I, I'm kind of, uh, I've got like a new appetite for the challenge in a way because it's like, yeah. okay, well, I'm being forced into this now. Like I don't, I don't have a choice. Like I gotta, I gotta do something. I'm going to stay in shape. So I now have like new targets. Like, okay, by the time this whole thing is over, I want to be able to do this movement. I want to be able to do that movement. And then I plan to sort of incorporate that even when I do start going back to hit the gym again. Yeah. And that, to your point, there are certain, there are certain um, body weight strength elements that would round out a traditional. So even if your, your plan is to go back and you're going to do mostly loaded barbell, dumbbell work or whatever, mm. there are certain things and you can even load them. So for example, a Cossack squat or a side to side squat also is, <laughs> yeah, but they're really, really good for opening up the hips yeah. um, for the adductors. And so you can use those. And I, I think they're awesome to do pre or even after depending on, but, but for your, for your lower body training, for your squat sessions, uh, hanging leg raises are amazing for the whole anterior chain for the, for the core. Mm -hmm. And so there's certain movements that even if you were to program a, if you had a full gym and you had all the equipment and you're going to, you can have access to everything. There are certain body weight strength elements that I think, okay, program these things in there mm -hmm. and they're still going to benefit you and help you improve at your traditional lifting. Cause I think what happens is oftentimes we have all this equipment that we have access to. And so people basically everything they program then involves equipment of some type. Mm -hmm. They completely jettison. Yes. You see what I mean? It's almost like, okay, how am I going to use dumbbells, barbells? How am I going to use this stuff? Mm -hmm. And there's literally zero movements, e even instead of pull-ups, it's lat pull downs. And mm. there's a place for lat pull downs. There's a place for every exercise, Sure. but a lat pull down is not as good as a properly performed pull-up. No. So when and, people and, are like, and this is the funny thing, sorry to jump in. Like that's the funny no, go thing because I do pull-ups, right? I've done pull-ups for over a decade. So I'm very strong on pull-ups. So yeah. like, it's weird. It's like, I can do all this. I can do this. I can do that. I can do that. And then it's like, I try something brand new and it's like, like, nope, flat on your butt. Um, so yeah, no, I think um, what, what you're, I'm just like agreeing with what you're saying, just talking about how I've experienced it myself, because as someone who's been going to the gym for like over 15 years, the thing is as well is like you maybe this might be like a male ego pride thing though it's like you also want to do the things you're good at right it's really hard to yeah, yeah if yeah, i know yeah. i'm not good at something right it's hard to like, when i go to the gym i want to deadlift. i'm a, I'm a boss at deadlifts right i want to deadlift right? i want to yeah, do, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i don't want to do a pistol squat like i uh, like I'll, I'll learn that later and then now i'm in this time and it's like okay well you can't deadlift so you know you better try that pistol squat and then you try it and you're like okay i'm glad i'm not learning in public <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you. And the, the, the thing that I think when it comes to, like in your case, when you start trying these different movements and you realize that you can't perform them, there's number one, the neuromuscular adaptation that has to happen from practicing a movement. Mm. But number two, sometimes you find that you do have a weakness you didn't realize you had. Yeah. So maybe you're super fit, but you go, oh man, the rotational torque on my core, my, my core is actually not where as strong as I think it is. Mm. So maybe that's what's holding you back. Or a lot of times, you know, maybe you have your, in your case with your deadlift, I'm sure this isn't the case, but maybe your glutes aren't as strong as they should be. Mm. Or sometimes not being able to perform a specific movement, it can hint at mobility issues. A lot of people have poor shoulder mobility and they don't realize it. Mm. So, or, or poor hip mobility. So in, in a traditional weight training environment, you don't often have to be able to move yourself through the same positions that you do for some of these body weight strength movements. And so a lot of people don't realize, man, my hamstrings are a lot tight because people will tell me, Hey, what, how come I can't do this pistol or how come I can't do it? And I'll look at the yeah. video and I'm like, dude, your, your hams are super tight <laughs> yeah, yeah. or, you know, you've got to open up your hips. 
And they, they're like, oh, I didn't realize I'm strong enough, but it's a mobility issue. Mm. So, you know, during this time when you're down, um, whether it's shoulder mobility, hip mobility, if you're working on this stuff, try, try to, I hate the mind muscle connection. People always use that term, but think about like, you know, proprioception, think about where your body parts are. And as you're moving, if you're trying a pistol, at what point does your strength give out? When do you fall over? Yeah. If you're trying the side to side squats, can you get into position, but then you fall backwards? Mm -hmm. Th those things will give you clues as to where, where you're weak and what you need to work on. And so there's a little bit of, you know, as you practice it, you, you learn that stuff. But I definitely think that body weight strength training like that, like this can help you identify areas where you happen to be weak, either in mobility or strength. Mm -hmm. and, and for anyone who's, uh, who's going to listen to this and go try it, I, I'm telling you right now, this is coming from, this is coming from like a, a gym OG, man. It is humbling. It is very, very humbling. So what I wanted to talk a, about a little bit was some of the more practical elements, right? Because there'll, there'll be people listening to this who are like, okay, like these two guys are both, uh, you know, buff fitness guys, right? Like, what can I, what should I do, right? What can I do? Right. So for someone who's, um, let's start with someone who's, who's a beginner right? Someone who's not, who's not in great shape, maybe hasn't, doesn't go to, maybe, you know, just goes to the gym very casually, hasn't been training for that long. What sort of um, exercises or program would you recommend for them, especially during this time? Okay. So when you're, when you are new to training or just deconditioned in general, the thing to remember is that when you are training with your body, there is no real way from most things to isolate. And so what I mean by that is a lot of people, and it's, I think it's to their detriment, a lot of people when they're new, they go to the gym and what they'll do is they'll do a lot of bicep curls, they'll do a lot of tricep pull downs, they'll mm -hmm. do all these you know, leg extension and, and hamstring curl. And so think about sitting on these machines that isolate one joint and you're doing these single joint movements. There's nothing wrong with that. They still do stimulate you know, strength adaptation. They do still stimulate hypertrophy. But what happens is if you spend 10 minutes doing bicep curls, then majority of the work was done by the biceps. I mean, you yeah. spent a lot of time to train a very small percentage of the musculature. Mm -hmm. And when you're new, um, you, you really need overall general physical preparedness. You need to strengthen everything. Yeah. And so you're much better off to invest your time doing compound multi-joint movements. So thinking a squat, mm -hmm. a bench press, but for newer trainees, when you do a bench press, you are still able to remove much of the body's kinetic chain. You're, you're able to disengage a lot of the musculature, especially if mm -hmm. you don't really know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're sitting there and you're, you're, for lack of a better word, isolating the chest. When you do a push-up, you're holding a plank. Yeah. And so what's happening in a push-up, and the reason some, some beginners and a lot of, some females, some men, uh, they can't perform a push-up, which is fine. Everybody starts somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason they can't perform a push-up is not for lack of pressing strength. A lot of times it's because their core is too weak. They can't hold that plank and move throughout that, that movement pattern. Mm -hmm. So what I like about body weight training, especially for people that are newer, is you really need to build strength from head to toe. Yes. And when you are performing these movements, there is no other option. You can't do a push-up if you can't do a plank adequately. Mm -hmm. And so I think really a, a Push-ups are a very good starting point from, from as far as pressing goes. And the thing to remember is whenever you are pressing, it's a good idea to offset that with an equal amount of pulling. Yes. And so one of the things I see on like Twitter, for example, is people are like, oh, we're on lockdown. I'm doing 100 push-ups a day. And that's, that's great. I'm not, definitely physical activity. Any physical activity is great. Yeah. But if you were to do push-ups every day for, for a prolonged period and you never do any pulling, you're probably going to end up with muscular imbalances and, and shoulder pain and a bad posture. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to think is, okay, if I'm pushing, I also need to do some pull. The problem is a lot of people can't do pull-ups. You've got to work up to it. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe right now they have zero equipment. Yes. And so they don't have a pull-up bar in the first place. They don't have gymnastics rings. And so you can utilize a table to do rows. Um, I'm, I have never, I've not posted that just cause I'm, I'm hesitant that someone will do it wrong and drop a table on their face. Okay. Um, <laughs> but you, How but do you, you do can, rows with a table. If you have a, if you have a sturdy table and you mm -hmm. move the chairs out and then you would basically get underneath of the table okay. and grab the edge of the table. And so you're laying, so you're laying almost parallel to the floor and the table and, and with your feet on the ground. Gotcha. 
And as long as the table's sturdy enough to hold you, okay. you're pulling on the edge of the table and rowing yourself up to the table. Mm. A safer alternative, I've not had anybody get hurt doing that, but I just, you know, yeah. <laughs> you've got to have some common sense and test depends, your table and make sure table. it's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I just... But what you can do is... Um, I have a video on my YouTube that basically says no pull up bar, no problem. Mm -hmm. And it shows you how to utilize any doorway. And so if you can imagine you step into the doorway, like you're going to walk through it, then you turn 90 degrees and stare at the door frame. And then you grab the, basically the door frame usually is going to have some molding around it. Mm -hmm. And so you would grab the molding. And if you imagine tug of war, if you've ever played tug of war and you're pulling on the rope and the people on the other side are pulling on the rope, nobody's moving but you're rowing with the rope against mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. And so what you would do is stand in a door frame and grab a hold of the door frame and pull by pushing down with your legs, just like you're pulling on the door frame playing tug of war. And then mm -hmm. you would just slowly, basically you would slowly row yourself up to the door frame and back, which mm -hmm. I, I demo it in that YouTube video, but that that's probably the best way to row for anybody anywhere in the world with no equipment. All you need is a door frame, which I'm assuming if you're on lockdown, you got a door frame. Yeah. Um, so, so I think for a you beginner, can do, you can also do it with like a, like a pole or a post as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You can grab a hold. If you got a tree, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a tree that you can wrap your arms around a pole, a post, if you, um, and I think in the video I demonstrated on a post, but if you, if you do a, a basically pressing, you can start with push ups. That's going to train the anterior core, the front of the front of the body. Mm -hmm. Um, if you are not strong enough to do push ups, you can start with push ups against the wall. Mm -hmm. And that way you're not working against gravity. The problem with push ups, if you're very, overweight relative to your your muscle mass and fat so meaning like if you have a poor power to weight ratio and you're so if you if you weigh 250 or 200 pounds even but you don't have much muscle you're pressing a lot more weight as a percentage of body weight than somebody who's got more muscle and less fat if that yeah. makes sense yeah. so what happens is you can do standing push-ups against the wall as you start to build strength, you keep moving your feet back. So you're pressing yourself into the wall a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. Then eventually you can take your, your hands and elevate them on a sofa or a table. And now you are scaling to a little bit more difficult of a push up, And then you would build strength there, then eventually to the floor. Mm -hmm. So, and again, I demonstrate that on my YouTube as well. But that, that's where you could basically take someone, no matter what level they're at, and start them with very, very beginner basic push-ups. Then with rows, because you're not working against gravity, it doesn't matter how much you weigh, you could do those standing rows. And then body weight squats, that's where you would start for lower body. No matter how overweight you are, um, the lower body is more powerful than the upper body. Yeah. And everybody should be able to do squats. If you have very poor mobility in the hips, um, you might start by doing squats onto a chair. So if you're listening to this and you're like, man, I've never exercised in my life, I'm super out of shape, yeah. you can take a low chair. And it'd be similar to a box squat, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And basically, you would just lower yourself into the chair. And as soon as your butt kisses the chair, you come back up. But this way, if you were to fall backwards, you don't fall over and hurt yourself. Sure. So, but for, for the average person, push-ups, rows, and squats, just those three things will build a nice base of strength and conditioning. Mm. And then you can always expand and add to that. But those are the three that I think are like the minimum that awesome. I would do. Um, and yeah, I recommend everybody. I, I, it's not often that I, I shout out specific YouTube channels, but um, I massively recommend Jerry's channel because I have learned a lot from it. Like I said, I, I, I could be considered a fitness expert in my, in my own regard, right? I have my own fitness book, which has yeah, sold course. a lot of copies. I'm always giving people fitness advice, but I've already learned a lot from Jerry's channel. Like I said, I don't normally do huge amounts of body weight training. When I do, it's like, you know, the basic stuff, push-ups, pull-ups, uh, planks, you know, body weight squats occasionally and stuff like that. But I've seen some stuff on there and just learned a whole bunch of new exercises already. So um, yeah, I'm going to actively promote Jerry's YouTube channel. I've actually already sent it to multiple people because I've had people asking me for advice and I've been like, look, it'll just go on this guy's channel and he'll explain a lot of this stuff better than, better than I can. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. That's all blessed, man. So, um, Moving on then, so for someone who's a little bit more intermediate, okay, so someone who's been, you know, maybe going to the gym for a couple of years, you know, maybe, you know, maybe got, some, got some good strength on them, made some good gains, but again, maybe like myself, just isn't really that, you know, great at body weight training, you know, they can do body weight squats, they can do push-ups, but that stuff's a, a, little bit, a little bit too simple and a little bit too right. easy for them unless they're going to just go for endurance. So for someone who's at that sort of level, 
how would you, um, so for the beginner, you've recommended doing um, push-ups. They can do them against the wall if need be. You've recommended the body weight squats and you've recommended the uh, doorway or post sort of rows. So for someone who's um, sort of one level up from there, what would you recommend for them? So um, basically I have, I have a intermediate workout that's eight movements on the YouTube, like you know, demonstrate the full workout. Mm -hmm. And that's really designed to go from head to toe. And you know, you, the thing that you would be doing in the gym, generally people are going to have a horizontal row and they're going to have a vertical row. So, you know, you figure your, your pull-ups, that's like your vertical row. Your horizontal row is whether somebody likes to do bent over barbell rows or whether you like to do um, one arm dumbbell rows, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of, so people, when they're thinking the gym, I basically took most training programs in a traditional gym and thought, how do I, how do I make the equivalent in, in body weight strength training? And the easiest way to do that is if you have a set of gymnastics rings. So if you, if you are stuck at home and you want to do a more advanced training sessions, then I would definitely recommend picking up a set of gymnastics rings and hang them from something that can support your weight, be it a pull up bar in the doorway. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of people do that. It's, it's perfectly safe. Um, you can get a doorway pull up bar. You can hang gymnastics rings from it. Uh, but rings will allow you to get a much closer to a one to one transition from a traditional weighted movement to a body weight movement. And so, and the reason I mentioned that is for example, with rows, if you have some gymnastics rings or you could do it with a bar. Mm -hmm. So if you have like a rack at home and you have a barbell, you can adjust, you could row on the barbell. But if you have rings, what happens is you can do, you're able just like a dumbbell, you're able to go neutral grip. You're able to move your grip into whatever position is more, most comfortable for you. So you can do one arm ring rows. So if you imagine laying parallel to the ground and you're going to perform body weight rows, mm -hmm. you may be able to do quite a few and not get the same intensity relative to what you could do with a, you know, a loaded barbell at a gym. But as soon as you take that to one arm, it now becomes much, much more difficult. Whatever it is that you weigh, you know, a large percentage of that's being pulled by that single arm on the upper body. And so you're able to transition into a very intense row. Um, at the same time with rings, you can do dips, which are more difficult, uh, especially on rings. The rings are an unstable surface, so you have to incorporate stability. Um, and what happens is once you get on rings, you can do dips. But if you have a lot of upper body pressing strength, you can do wide or what are called Bulgarian dips. And those would be very similar. So I, I've had guys reach out that, especially since this, this um, lockdown started and they're like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a 315 venture. You know, I, I'm trying to target failing eight to 12 reps. Yeah. And if you do wide, wide dips on a set of gymnastics rings, most guys that are strong will fail at eight to 12 and you'll mm -hmm. have just a ridiculous pump mm. that will remind you of how it would feel to get up after a set of heavy bench. Okay. Um, so if you're not a beginner and you're more intermediate, I, I highly suggest getting a set of rings just because that opens up a whole nother, you know, a whole nother world of upper body strength that you will be able to perform that you just can't do without the rings. Yeah. So, so that would be the biggest thing. And the rings are like 20 to $30, depending if you want to buy plastic or wood. Mm -hmm. So they're dirt cheap. Okay. I mean, for the price, you can't really beat it. Um, and so then once you have rings, the nice thing is that's all the equipment that you would need to scale from intermediate all the way to very advanced. Mm -hmm. um, now, at the intermediate level, provided you, you have some rings or something to row on, then like I just mentioned, your, your body weight rows and you can scale the difficulty of those rows to match your current ability level. You've got your dips. And again, you can scale those dips to match your current ability level mm -hmm. um, pull-ups. And then you've got your, your body weight squats. You're going to want to start transitioning into, you know, single leg work. And that can be assisted pistol squats, mm -hmm. which if you imagine doing your pistol squats in a doorway yeah. and you can reach your arms out and grab the sides of the doorway so that do you don't ones. fall over. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Any, anybody, anybody should be able to do them because you can fully spot yourself. Yeah. Um, but even then they're not easy, no, they're even, not easy. <laughs> even spotting yourself. Yeah, yeah. So for, so assisted pistol squats and then your, your Cossack or your side to side squats, which most people 
uh, some people call them lateral squats. Mm -hmm. if, if you see a video of them, you'll think, oh, okay, I know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And so what you're basically doing is just squatting, you know, to either the left or the right where one leg is going down, you know, you're, you're actually pressing with one leg while the other leg is straight out to the side. Mm -hmm. Um, much easier to see in a video, but, yeah, yeah. but basically your side to side squats and your assisted pistol squats will be the base for lower body training. Mm -hmm. And then your, the, the thing about body weight strength training that is missing from traditional training, I think that is important is having some kind of loaded hip hinge. Okay. And you know, you, you can't deadlift. We deadlifting is picking something heavy off the ground. Sure. And if you're, if you're body weight strength training, we have to basically work against gravity or, or leverage. You can't pick stuff up off the ground because that's yeah. just not what we're doing. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah, there's, yeah. there is no substitute. So what, what you have is a pseudo hip hinge, which is basically a hip thrust. Mm -hmm. And if you're listening, you, you may have seen people do this where you put your back onto like a bench or a chair, and then you take a barbell and put it across your waist and mm -hmm. you thrust the waist up and you do it weighted. Mm -hmm. And so it's the exact same movement pattern if you just Google hip thrust. But the difference is because we don't have a barbell, you, if you're new, if you're a beginner, you would do them with both legs down and they will basically, they will effectively train the glutes and the hamstrings, but you just do them on one leg. Yeah. And so by lifting up one leg, it increases the intensity quite a bit. If mm -hmm. you're more intermediate and you can't deadlift right now, um, then what you can do is you can do the glute thrust single leg mm -hmm. and it'll help keep you uh, performing a hip hinge. Now you're not going to increase your deadlift right now, you know, obviously. <laughs> um, but if you, if you're not doing a hip hinge at all, chances are you're going to backslide on your deadlift. Mm -hmm. And so if you are at least adding in the single leg hip thrust, um, then you can maintain where you're at in your deadlift and hopefully not lose, you know, the progress that you had when you, when you quit going to the gym. Yeah. But yeah, who, I would say knows, maybe, maybe someone might, I mean, someone like myself, I don't know. I wouldn't be shocked if I sort of went back to the gym like, assuming i keep up with the well i'm not assuming i'm going to keep up with uh the body weight training i'm doing but if i can i feel like if i can not master but at least get the hang of some of these movements i i myself I, assuming we're not locked down for too long i wouldn't be surprised if um you know i actually find myself getting being stronger on certain things just from having such a you know because after a certain amount of training especially doing a type of training you know, you, you, you level out, you, you sort of, you sort of flatline. Like I, I'm not going to get, my deadlift isn't going to get much stronger. You know, there's not that much room. My right. yeah, yeah. bench isn't going to get <clears throat> that much stronger, right? Like there's not that much room. There's just not that much room to grow. But I feel like with incorporating some of these movements, it's like, oh, okay, well, if I can get the hang of that and, you know, really do that, then that might give the sort of, you know, it may address that, those weak links that may now yeah. allow me to take those things to another level. Well, that, and actually you bring up a good point because one of the things that I had, I had a lot of low back pain and some issues cropping up before I started doing this style of training. Mm -hmm. And I don't credit necessarily this style of training for getting me past those issues. But what this did do is like I mentioned earlier, it revealed a lot of weaknesses I had yes. that I didn't know that I had. And one of the biggest ones was I had low back pain and I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And after a whole bunch of troubleshooting and reading, I, I realized Hey, my, my glute medius is not as strong as it should be relative to the rest of my lower body musculature. Okay. And so I started doing a lot of abductions and like clamshells. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if, especially I think women listening to this on average, if they, if they work out, you probably don't have this problem because generally women tend to focus on the lower body to a higher degree than most guys do. Definitely. And I know this isn't always the case, but this is yeah, yeah. in my observation, you know, women are like, they want the booty, they want the legs yeah. and guys are like trying not to work legs if they have, if they don't <laughs> have to. <laughs> it's true. It sounds cliche, um, but it is true. Yeah. And so I, and I, I mean, I, I squatted, I deadlifted and all this, but you know, I did walking lunges and whatever else, but I realized, man, I don't do a lot of lateral strength. Mm -hmm. You know, everything's, training front to back, what's called like sagittal plane training. I was, yeah. Think about squatting, you're facing forward, you're walking lunges, you're walking forward, everything's forward. And then I realized, man, so your glute medius is responsible for moving the leg away from the body. It controls your, your gait when you walk and run. Mm -hmm. But I, it, it like hit me all of a sudden, I'm like, man, I, I've neglected this thing forever. Yeah. And so then when I started focusing on it, I started to have less and less low back pain. And now I don't have any. Interesting. But the reason I mentioned that is because in athletes, increasing your, if, if your glute medius is behind 
relative to the rest of the musculature in a lower body, if you address it, you, you actually will get stronger. Mm. Your squat will probably go up okay. and your deadlift will probably go up. So I may, I if may have that issue. Yeah. So, so it's just something, if you're listening and you're thinking, okay, what am I going to work on until I can get back to the gym? Mm -hmm. Like Google glute medius and you can Google different exercises for it. And I have one on my YouTube channel. I have a playlist for glutes specifically that you don't need any equipment for, but definitely figure out some way to target the glute medius and strengthen it because it, it, it is one of the muscles that you can work that will probably be a weakness for a lot of people mm -hmm. that will translate into being better at your other lifts when you do get back to it. Awesome. And the, the, the machine in the gym that does train it, like it's 98% only used by women. And so, the slang <laughs> term for it, I'm not, yeah, yeah. Don't, I, I'm not trying to offend anybody. But I know, I know. It's called the good girl, bad girl machine. That's what, that's what guys call it, right? <laughs> because you, there's no cause, 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 cause they have two machines. And so if you're yeah. listening to this, like you'll, you'll understand <laughs> there's two machines. And when you sit on it, there's pads that go on the outside of the thighs yeah. or outside of the quads, I mean. And you, you open up your legs and you're pressing out, right? And that's going to strengthen the glute medius. Mm -hmm. And then they have the other one where you start with your legs open and the weight, the, the pads are against the thighs and you squeeze yeah. them together. And you're right. You will see women on those things religiously. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and guys will just walk by and look at them and yeah, they don't yeah. want to get on there. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, it's but, funny. But, yeah, but those things, if you're a guy and when a gym opens back up, you probably should get on those. Like, yeah. who cares? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting because you know, human beings are funny and it's like, there is, you can't overlook these sort of like psychological patterns because, you know, it, it's as hard to get a guy to do some of those exercises as it is to get a woman to do like the shoulder press or to get, get under a bench or something, you know, it's just, right. there's, there's, there's this weird, I don't know, fear or concern or just kind of like, nah, that's just not, that's just not for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be honest. Like I do, I do use that. Um, What's it, is it the adduction? A, a, yeah, Ad, one's, uh, one's adduction and one's abduction. Yeah, like I do use that from time to time. But when I'm on it, something's just like <laughs> the, the <laughs> feeling I have on it versus like when I'm like, you know, deadlifting or doing pull-ups or being on. I'm like, what? part of me is like, why am I doing this? You know? <laughs> yeah. It, and it's, but it's, you know, it's one of those exercises that it's like, you don't do it because you enjoy it, but you yeah. do it because it's a necessary evil kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like the, the version I have is basically a, a body weight clamshell. You're pressing yourself up off the floor with mm -hmm. the glute medius. But when I first, when I was trying to think to myself, okay, how am I going to address this, you know, with just body weight? And then I tried different movements and I'm like, okay, this feels the best. But I'm sitting there in my head. And I'm like, man, this is like Jane Fonda, <laughs> you know, if you know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's like at the end of the day, I, it, it's, it's necessary. Of so course. yeah, definitely – Definitely, um, I think we all have these preconceived notions of mm. what is, you know, quote unquote manly. Yeah. And like you, like you mentioned with women too, a lot of times they're hesitant to perform certain things. Um, I think now, especially, it's probably one of the good things about CrossFit. Weight training in general is much more mainstream. It's not just a bodybuilding thing anymore. It's not, you know. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's very good that that happened. But there's a recent study that came out and I'll tweet it so people can go check it off if they want to see it. But they, they looked at women and men and they concluded that like, you know, basically there's no difference in how they should train. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, women will think, well, what about for a, for a woman? How should I be training as a woman? Yeah. And your musculature is almost, I mean, it's, we're, we're human. It's very yeah, yeah. hormonal differences. But other than that, it's, there's not a difference, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's one of the hardest things for men and women to kind of get across is like, you don't have, you don't really train differently Yeah. for different goals and different sports. Certainly you would train differently, Yeah. but you know, a, a female sprinter is not training different than a male sprinter. A male sprinter no, I think, yeah. it, I think it tends to be, you know, men and women want to accentuate different body parts. Right. And it's yeah, funny, yeah. man. It, it is funny when you think of it, like a lot of this stuff does just boil down to like a very primal human <laughs> you know like you know sort of like the the whole mating psychology right as a guy like you talk to a guy who wants to start going to the gym okay like what do you want yeah i want like my arms to be bigger i want my shoulders to be wider right? oh yeah i want a six pack i want my chest to be big. like you, you're never gonna it's you're, you don't have a guy who's like yeah like my glutes and my hamstring it, it, it just doesn't happen right but then you yeah 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 and it's like, yeah, you know, like my, my, I want like my bum, like I want my tummy to be a bit flatter. I want like, you know, my bum to be, you know, like this. You know a girl's not going to come and be like, yeah, you know, I want bigger shoulders. I want my arms to be, it's, it, it is a, I just, I just find stuff like that funny because 
some people might listen and if someone's like super PC, they might think like, oh, that sounds sexist or that sounds like, and it's like, look, that's just, that's just reality. You know, it's a generalization, but it's, you know, 95, I'd, pro I'd probably say it's like 95%. Yeah. 95% well, you know, of cases. The thing is like, I think that you have different patterns that just people in general tend to gravitate toward. Yeah. And you know, whether it's, it's evolutionary or like you, you, like you mentioned, maybe it's driven by, attracting a maid or whatever the, oh, whatever definitely. the case is. Yeah, definitely. But there's always exceptions. And that like, I, I don't, if, if you're the exception, that's great. I don't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but people like a whole other topic, but people tend to get mm -hmm. offended when you say something or not you, but just in yeah. general, when you, you say something like, Oh, guys tend to not want to use this machine or girls tend to like this. It's just true. <laughs> I, there's, yeah. But clearly there's exceptions to the rule. Like if you're the exception, awesome. Nobody cares. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, it's not, it's not a big deal, but yeah, it, it, there's definitely, um, I think it's probably important to point out too. So if you, if you're listening and you're like, man, these guys talking about working out, I don't really care. Um, <laughs> there, there's a, I guess like a narcissistic side to it where, you know, you're working out because you want to look better and, that there's nothing wrong with if you go get your hair done if you if you so if you're a woman and you do your nails and do your nails and get your hair done but then you're like oh working out's just another tool mm. exercise is just another tool to help improve your appearance if that's important to you but that's not the only or even primary reason why you should physically train no. and the, the thing is when you look at research physical activity is very strongly correlated to human longevity. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't give a shit at all, what you look like, you should still exercise. Yes. It, it's not about, but, and so while vanity is one reason, that's not the only reason, mm. you know, right? So I, I always like to point out to people, cause I have people that will ask me like, well, I don't really care what I look like. So why should I exercise? And mm. I, I think, okay, when you have, and it may be you're only 30 years old, but you know, I'm assuming that whatever it is that you like to do in life today you want to still be able to do when you're 50 and 60 and 70. Yeah. And the thing is, once you somewhere around 40, you start to lose muscle mass annually. Yes. And so if you don't insert some physical activity and some resistance training, you're going to lose muscle mass, which becomes an issue because that then you start to become weaker every year mm -hmm. and you start to become less of a, you know, less of a member of our species that's able to endure hardship. Yes. The stronger that you are, the, the, the more muscle mass that you have to, to an extent. I'm not talking about bodybuilding or being yeah, massive. You need to go right? to an extreme, yeah, of course. No, no, no. But, but yeah. just the more muscle mass that you can preserve and even build as you age, the better you're able to stand, withstand. Just think, think about if you get in a car accident. If, if you and I are driving, not, not you, you're pretty well built. But if two people are driving and they hit each other in a head-on collision, uh, yeah, chances are there's going to be some, some catastrophic injury. Yes. But if you have a stronger body than the other person, the other person's 45 years old, 50 years old, and they've not taken care of themselves, they're less well able to endure physical trauma, mm. be it from like a car accident or, you know, God even, forbid even somebody. An illness. Even well, an that's illness. what I was going to say. God forget, forbid you get cancer or yeah. you, something like that happens. The weaker your body is, I mean, you can actually look at this virus right now. People in a, a weaker mm -hmm. physical state are more likely to have a more serious you know, adverse reaction. Yeah. And so I, I try to let people know my, my primary goal is to help people get physically training. If they graduate and go on to train at a regular gym, if they, whatever they, I, I don't care. I just like yeah. people to be active because I do think that from a health and longevity standpoint, it's hugely beneficial mm -hmm. for a myriad reasons. Yeah. Um, Everybody, and, but everybody even, should do. Everybody should do something. Everybody, should, you know, everybody should exercise. Like when I say that, some people think like everyone thinks like I, everyone should be. I'm not saying everyone should be a power lifter or everyone right. should be a bodybuilder or whatever. But everybody should <clears throat> do some physical exercise, and that should include resistance training as well. Like the the benefits go way beyond the vanity. I mean, firstly, I mean, you were saying that people are saying they don't care what they look like. Firstly, I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna straight up say I think you should <laughs> I think you should care what you look like. Right. I think everybody, I don't, I don't even think that I feel, I even feel like most people who would say that would kind of be being in denial, right? There's no one who, if you could look a little bit better, like why, why wouldn't you want to I'm not saying you can like, you know, let's change your face or something, but like, <laughs> why wouldn't you want, it's like getting it. Like you mentioned getting a haircut. It's like, well, why don't get a haircut or like wear a nice, wear a nice shirt, or like wear, you know, like, everyone. well, I think, no, and I, I think, 
society, and it's been this way since, I mean, you can even look at, you know, ancient Egypt, society bases a lot of how it, how it sees you, it bases a lot of it on appearance. It does. It's just so reality. I don't have a problem. If somebody says, Hey, I don't care what I look like. That's cool. I mean, we're all free to be who, however you want to be. Of course. But there's actually research where they've looked at people who are more physically attractive and all like you're, like you mentioned, you can only do so much with your face. I mean, yeah. maybe you do like an upper body session then a lower body session then a face session. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to work face. Exactly. Um, face day. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but a new program dropping. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I do think that, you know, you do help stack the deck in your favor better. Um, even from a success standpoint, when you're talking about, you know, professional success and getting promoted, or you're talking about getting the job or whatever else, like people do judge you. It's in a way, it's unfortunate that people judge you based on how you look, but I don't make the system. We, we all just live in it. It just is. It just and, is. Right. And so it is what it is. And like, I understand there's always people wanting to better the system, change the system. And then that's awesome. But we've been prioritizing looks for 5,000 years. Mm. And so it's probably not going to change anytime soon. And so I do think that there are, and I, and I have it all the time. People will start exercising. They'll start losing weight. They'll start eating better. They kind, they kind of go hand in hand. If you, if you have a hard time with poor food choices, and, but you've never really exercised, once you start getting consistent with exercise, it's, it's physical work. And then you start doing this physical work. And so now you want to support that by eating yeah, better. Yeah. It, it, they kind of reinforce each other. But what happens is people start to lose weight and look better and they start to feel better. They start mm -hmm. to become more confident. And so it's definitely something where I think that not, you're not doing it for other people, but it will elevate how other people look at you, yeah. you know, in the, in the long term. So I do think that you like, to your point, you, you should care how you look, not, not necessarily to impress other people, but because mm -hmm. it, it will benefit your ability to further whatever your pursuits are in life. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's the same reason why I think you should, it, you should read books, right? You should um, have, yeah, exactly. you know, you should, you should learn how to have good conversations with people. You should learn how to listen. You should learn how to make eye contact with people. Not because you're necessarily trying to impress people. I mean, that, that could be the case, but just in terms of sort of maximizing your potential or at least somewhat maximizing your potential as a human being, there right. are certain things that you should just do. Like no one you know, like people brag about like, oh, I don't go to the gym. I'd never go to the gym. I don't exercise, whatever. It's like, well, would you brag about like, I mean, I guess some people do this, but they sound silly, right? You, when you brag about not being educated or brag about not reading books or brag about not knowing how to like learn a new skill. Or so it's like, why would you, why would you brag about that? Like, that's not, that's not, that's not a good trait. You know, I'd rather talk to and associate with and be friends with people who do read books because they're going to be more interesting. They're going to be, they're going to have more knowledge on different subjects, right? Their, their, their brain is going to work in a different way. So yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm big on people. I'm just big on self-improvement in general, right? No, yeah, I, none of us are perfect. We're never going to make ourselves perfect, but you may as well strive towards improving yourself. Right. And I think, you know, you, if you, if you look back at whether it's we were created or we evolved or whatever, technology has displaced our need to physically work. Like if you go back a hundred years and you're like, Oh, I'm going to go work out. Our mm -hmm. grand, great grandparents would have thought you're we stupid. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because for the majority, most part, unless you were wealthy, especially pre-industrial revolution, you had to do physical work every day just to survive. Right. Yes. You had washing clothes by hand and walking everywhere and things like that. Even mounting a horse, right. You still have to climb up on the horse. True. So we're at a time and a point in history where there really is a need to be cognizant of adding physical work back into our daily lifestyles because we don't have to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so like with what you're saying, as far as self-improvement, I think there is, there's the, the person who's going to start exercising and feel like drawn to it. And they, 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 it becomes a big part of their life, but that doesn't have to be the average person. One, one resistance training session a week will present sarcopenia and basically age related muscle wasting. So you could do one full body session a week and that's enough. Okay. Twice a week's even better. Twice yeah. a week is solid for the average person. If you don't love training and you're like, man, that's just not me. I don't want to work out all the time. Mm -hmm. Twice a week will do it. And so it's not a massive commitment, but I think that even if you're thinking about this from an intellectual standpoint, like why should I physically train? Well, I mean, very simply, we 
evolved or were created or whatever to be physical. Yeah. And so you're just inserting the minimum to maintain yourself. And, and so, sometimes I'll talk to people that are very brilliant and they're like very resistant to exercise. It's interesting, and, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the thing is, it, it can be endurance based work. You can go jog the dogs, you know, you can, you can do play tennis. It doesn't have to be like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to go be a gym bro for two hours a week. It doesn't have to be that at all. But the other thing to remember is that there's research suggesting that as you exercise and you're physically active, gray matter within the brain increases, you know, it, it, you, your IQ is higher. If you're smart mm -hmm. and you don't exercise mm -hmm. and you start exercising, you will be smarter. smarter. Yeah. So it's almost like don't, if you need for your motivation to not be physical, if you need for your motivation to not be about your body, then let it be about your brain is housed mm -hmm. inside your body. And so the, the physical training that you do is going to enhance your, yes. your intellect, your, your, your mental edge. You know, you're going to have a mental edge that you didn't have if you don't yeah. exercise. It's so. part of why I find, why I find the, the, the meathead stereotype really funny because there's this, there's this idea that, you know, we live in some kind of like role-playing game where like, <laughs> you know, you have to sacrifice like intelligence for strength or like, <laughs> yeah. like you want to get a certain amount, you know, you, you've got, you've got 20 points, right? Like create your character and you have to distribute them here. Okay. If you, if you get too much strength, you lose in the intelligence, right? If you gain too much here, you lose. And it's like, in my own experience, I've mostly noticed the opposite of that, right? If I see someone, a, a, a man or a woman who's got like a great <clears throat> physique and is really into training or whatever, majority of the time, of course there are exceptions, right? But yeah, actually yeah. I find it seems to positively correlate with someone being um, more interesting and certainly being more, more disciplined and just being more, kind of just being, having their stuff together, right? It's like yeah, a you good sign that someone has their stuff together. You don't have to choose to be either a mage or a barbarian. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you, in fact, in fact, listen, go, go watch The Witcher and go watch The Witcher. Gar Geralt uses magic and he will slay you with a sword. He can do both, right? Yeah, like it's, yeah. So, people, people always think it's one or the other. Some people are like, oh, I'd rather be smart. And I'm like, what do you mean rather? <laughs> I'm, not saying be, I'm not saying like pick one or the other. It's like you can be smart and strong and in shape. Yeah, and the funny thing, you, this is, I think, a little bit interesting. I, I've all, I noticed that a lot of white collars, so like a lot of attorneys and doctors, they gravitate toward endurance sports, mm -hmm. cycling and, you know, and, and that type of stuff, marathons, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then on the blue collar side, you'll see people that will have gravitated more towards like bodybuilding, weight training. And interestingly, all exercise increases, you know, BDNF, which is like brain derived neurotropic factor and helps with in increasing neurological health. Mm -hmm. But that I think happens. There's some research that shows it's, it's more on the endurance side where you get the highest amount of gray matter and that type of stuff. So I sometimes wonder if it's like a, th that maybe has something to do with it. Like the, mm -hmm. the all exercise gives you that endorphins, it gives you a rush. You feel good after you complete it. But I, I used to think, okay, I wonder if the white collar crowd is more drawn to the endurance sports because of the neurological benefit, potential mm -hmm. neurological benefit. But then I started realizing, like, at least to me, endurance sports are very mental, not as physical. They're That's physically true. demanding. Yeah, yeah. But, so, like, if you go run five miles right now, the whole time you're running, your, your brain is saying, like, what in the hell are you doing? Stop yeah. doing this. <laughs> right? You're, like, mental endurance as well. It, it really is a mental endurance activity. And when you go to lift, your set can suck, but it's only like 30 seconds of That's suck, true. right? And then you're going to have some type of rest period. And so I think that on the endurance side, because like for myself, I'll go run, like I ran my dogs three and a half miles the other day. Mm -hmm. And when I finished, I felt like I accomplished some great feat. Not that that's very far, yeah, yeah. but I was like, man, I put in work, right? Yeah. But when I finish a, a strength training session, I enjoy the session, but I don't feel like I did something great, if that makes sense. So mm. I think that there is, like, I, I don't have a desire to run a marathon, but I, I feel like when you perform endurance work and you finish, the, there's a feeling of like, you had to tell yourself to not quit yeah. for a really long time That's true. That's comparatively. True. And so, you know, I, I think for like, to what your point is, people that are really into endurance sports oftentimes don't strength train mm. and so the where i'm kind of going with this is if you are a runner if you are a cyclist it will improve your 
cycling, your running, they will get better if you also strength train. Mm -hmm. um, one to two days a week is all you need. But the other benefit to strength training if you're an endurance athlete is that it will help reduce your chances of getting injured. Yes. And so injury prevention is a, a big benefit there. So if you're the type of person that thinks, oh, I like to run, I already jog, I don't need to strength train, I highly encourage you to add a little bit of strength training. Mm. Um, but and maybe, just and maybe to reduce some muscle wastage as well. You know, you, yeah, well, yeah, because what happens is, like you're right, the more that you endurance train, um, especially depending on how you eat and, and different factors, yeah, you can basically – end up not looking very athletic, even yeah. though you are yeah. able to perform well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, from muscle wasting, um, preventing injury. But I just found that interesting that when for and I don't know if you're the same way, but anytime I've done any type of endurance work, I get this sense of accomplishment that I don't get when I weight train. And mm -hmm. so I feel I, I feel like I kind of understand the people that I'm not going to run a marathon. I'll tell you that yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I can only imagine what it feels like to to mentally overcome yourself mm. for four hours or however long it takes to finish. That's true. And so I, so I, I think that's what draws people to that versus weight training. And I think the people that struggle to enjoy resistance training, whether it's body weight or, or traditional weight training, I think the people that struggle with that is they don't have that same sense of this sucks. I want to quit, mm. but I'm not going to let myself quit. Gotcha. And there's that sense of, of um, accomplishment that I find comes after endurance work that I don't get after, after weight training. Awesome. I'm just looking at the time, man. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about nutrition, but um, I think we might have to we might have to save that for uh, <laughs> save that for another one because that's a whole whole different topic. Because I know you eat mostly a carnivorous diet. Maybe you can give like a maybe just like a, a couple minute overview of the way you eat and why you eat that way. Yeah. So I uh, when I was younger, I ate higher carbohydrate, and when I was fat, I ate everything in sight. So that was, sure. <laughs> but notwithstanding that time period. Um, I've eaten high carb, low carb. I've been pescatarian, uh, not vegetarian, but just about every other way. I, I love to self experiment. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is I found that for, for, for me eating on the lower carbohydrate end of the spectrum, I just feel better from a mental energy standpoint throughout the day. Okay. My wife's the exact opposite. She's not low carb at all. She's not overweight. She, she does fine eating plenty of carbs. Mm -hmm. And so I've never, I've never adhered to like a one size fits all approach to diet. I think you've got to find what works for you. But when I was already very low carbohydrate, I had tried ketogenic dieting and um, I had basically GERD and which is gastrointestinal reflux disease. And I had uh, psoriasis. And when I would eat higher carbohydrate or, or any appreciable amount of, <clears throat> appreciable amount of grain, sorry. Um, what would happen is my GERD, my acid reflux would act up and I had psoriasis that was progressing independent of how I ate, but I was already researching different, you know, in, in the ketogenic circles and the keto crowd, I guess you would call it. And I noticed the carnivore movement popping up mm -hmm. and I thought it was insane because I'm like, dude, you're going to eat zero vegetables. This doesn't sound <laughs> healthy at all. You know, you guys are crazy. But I kept seeing anecdotes of people that were getting relief to autoimmune conditions mm -hmm by trying carnivore. And so I thought, okay, I know there are sensitivities to certain plant foods that people have. Maybe I've got an issue. So I decided to do a 30 day experiment and go carnivore to see what hap what would happen. So I did that. And within the first month, my psoriasis was completely gone. My GERD was like 98% or so controlled. Wow. And so I stuck with that for like seven months. And after seven months, I, it, it never relapsed. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, whatever was going on, it, it, there must've been either an overconsumption of, I was eating tons of spinach, tons of kale. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there was some common, you know, thing inside of those foods that was aggravating my condition. So yeah. I decided to go ahead and titrate back in some plant foods. And so after seven months, which was this last, how many months ago, about four months ago now mm -hmm. was, was when I started reintroducing some plants. So fast forward to today, I'm still low carb, but I eat like onions, garlic, I'll eat cilantro, um, avocado, some mm -hmm. green zucchini. So I basically added back in a few plant foods. And what I did is I did them one to two weeks at a time to make sure that my skin didn't react negatively to them. Yeah. So today I'm still low carb, but I'm not carnivore, not strict carnivore anymore. No, it's not um, strict. Gotcha. So you, yeah. you, you don't eat any fruits or grains? No, not right now. I mean, I... My daughter, well, actually, especially not on quarantine, but okay. uh, 
I have a 14 year old daughter and, and once in a while she wants to go have sushi when we, well, I'll take her out and we'll go eat just okay. dad and me and her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we'll go to the steakhouse one month and the next month she'll want to go. And sometimes she chooses sushi and then we just split three rolls. Okay. So I'll, and, and if I eat like that, um, the only thing that happens is I'll get a little acid reflux, but it's very rare that I eat like that. So it's not a big deal. It's kind of mm-hmm. like, I know going into it. Okay. I'm going to get, I'm going to have yeah. some, some yeah. acid reflux, but I haven't had my skin react. Um, negatively to the occasional meal like that but Mm. when i was so i was eating spinach and and kale in very high amounts i was buying a three and a half pound bag of spinach at costco every week and i was eating probably two pounds of it i'd end up having to throw some of it away but the the price per you know pound was way better that way but i was eating a lot of spinach and then there's different compounds in in spinach and in kale and in those leafy greens that people with autoimmune conditions sometimes have a problem with so I'm, Mm. i'm at least in my case, I'm thinking that was my issue, not eating small amounts of spinach because I have for most of my life. Mm-hmm. But when I started really increasing the, the spinach and kale intake is when my skin started to act up. That's um, interesting. It sounds, that'll sound so counterintuitive to most people. That, well, that's what happened to me. The reason yeah. I was like, man, I want to be healthy. So I'm going to really up <laughs> my leafy yeah. greens. Yeah. And then, but, but what I, what I think is really interesting is that, um, plants have these natural defenses, like, you know, these different, these different basically adaptations they've developed to prevent predation, to keep predators from eating them. Mm. And so in, in small amounts, I think for almost everybody, like I, I'm never going to be one of those people that you see online that's trying to convince you that plants are bad for humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I don't think the data support that at all, yeah. but we do have various sensitivities to foods depending on the individual. Mm -hmm. And so I do think there's something there from an autoimmune standpoint. So if you have an autoimmune condition and you're struggling to get it under control, you might experiment with an elimination diet, which that's what carnivore was for me. It was an elimination diet. It worked to, you know, take care of the two issues I was having. And then now I've been on the path of reintroducing foods slowly to making sure they don't cause an issue and so far so good. But yeah, so I'm not carnivore anymore. I, I, I always try to be very upfront and open with people yeah, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> um, and, and even then the dietary, if anybody's paid attention on social media, man, as, as crazy as people get about diet, I don't talk about it a whole lot anymore anyways. Yeah. You know, just because I, I, it's almost like politics. I don't talk about politics at all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, the, the diet, diet has become politics. I, I keep, you know, whenever I, uh, Whenever I, I'm, I'm a Christian myself, but when I talk to certain atheists, I, I always, you know, make jokes about how so many people have just uh, substitute, you know, other, other things have become religious for certain people, sort of often in the absence of religion, right? It becomes, it becomes their dietary habits. It becomes their political team. It becomes this, it becomes that. So it, it's just one of those random observations about society that I find, I find kind of amusing, right? Because I've spoken to... I've spoken to vegans, I've spoken to carnivores, I've spoken to the ones which are like hard line, you know, like really, you know, like going out trying to evangelize and convert people that I'm like, okay, you know, like, but I don't know, I, with me, yeah, like, no. okay, like I, I just eat food and if it works for me, like, you know, if it works for you, awesome. If that works for you, awesome. I don't, the whole one size fits all thing in either direction, it, it doesn't, you know, logically and rationally and just nutritionally, it doesn't sound like that makes sense for everybody. Like if you, if you think everybody should be eat full carnivore, that doesn't really sound right to me. If you think everybody is going to thrive in, on a vegan diet, I'm like, mm, I don't, I don't buy that either. Well, the, the biggest thing for me, if you, if you think about it the, in a nutshell, the, the best way I could describe how I think people should eat is if you look at modern hunter gatherer societies around the world. <clears throat> and so you're talking far Northern Inuit, all, you're talking like, you know, African tribes that are still active hunter-gatherers, South America. Mm-hmm. The, these people eat anywhere from 30% of their calories will come from animal foods. Mm-hmm. All the, you know, closer to the equator where they, they have plant foods available pretty much all the time. Yeah. And then as you go into far northern hunter-gatherers, it could be up to 96, 98%, depending on the season, mm-hmm. where the, it's animal foods. Yeah. And so the common thread to me with all these hunter gatherers is that they are all eating whole nutritious food, mm-hmm. right? That's like the foundation of their diet. And even though there's a huge range in how much plant and animal foods they eat, they all eat plant and animal foods. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm talking like on a broad, on a broad spectrum, I think if somebody eats, I, 
if somebody eats almost all plants and they eat a small amount of animal foods, mm -hmm. they can probably be healthy. Sure. If somebody eats mostly animal foods and a small amount of plants, they're probably still going to be healthy because sure. they're eating whole foods. And the other, the other side of it is they're not chronically over consuming dietary energy. Mm -hmm. That's the, the biggest lever to me is if you chronically overeat, even if it's healthy food, yeah. it doesn't matter. You're chronically overeating. You're going to gain and weight. Yeah. That, that, so, so, yeah, that's the biggest issue. And so even when I was going through my strict carnivore looking to treat autoimmune, yeah, I'm, I'm a low-carb advocate from the standpoint that I think it's a viable way to eat. It seems like just like you have atheists, they get mad at people for being Christian. Like, first of yeah. all, why do you care if somebody's Christian? Like, yeah, yeah. if you, if you want to be atheist, cool. I don't care. If you yeah, want to yeah, be Christian, course. awesome. Like, like that, that's awesome. Who cares? I've always never understood the atheists that get real bothered when you're Christian and that like, come after you. And it's like, dude. I've, I've had that a lot. <laughs> yeah, it makes no sense. And, so at, and, and at the same time, I would say I'm a low-carb advocate because that's how I feel best. Yes. But I also don't think that's how anyone else has to or should eat. I think people should I'll give an example like religion. Mm -hmm. I think that if you feel called, if you feel called to Christ, you feel called to God, then that's what you should, that's what you should worship. Like that's, sure. that's what you're called to, you know? So when it comes to food, if you feel good mm -hmm. eating higher carbohydrate diet, man, have mm -hmm. at it. Why am I going to tell you that you're wrong? No. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and so there's a lot of mainstream there, there are mainstream, there's even, you know, people who are credentialed, who are prominent and it's like, they're really anti low carb. And I'm like, dude, mm. if it works for people, let them if, 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 look, just whatever, like, you know, in the words of Jay-Z, I'll, tr I'll translate slightly to not be, um, profane, you know, <laughs> what you eat doesn't make me poop. <laughs> right. Like very, very literally in this, say very literally in this case. Right. So it's like, like what you're putting in your own body. That's like your own thing. It literally does not affect me in any way, shape or form. Yeah, like, exactly. I, I, I could not care yeah. any less. I care. I would like for people to eat in a manner for them to be healthy. Yeah, sure. Just because I think, I think if you just separate emotion from, from everything, our, in, in Western societies, especially our poor health is a massive drain economically on, on healthcare. Like it's, it's an issue. Like I, I just yeah. think as people, we kind of owe it to one another to just, try to be healthy, responsible citizenry, Agreed. right? Like you don't have to be an athlete. You don't have to be obsessive about food. But if we were all just 100 years ago healthy, mm -hmm. think about how much more money there would be to put toward yeah. things that are a better, better use of resources. Mm -hmm. so, so I definitely think that we should all be conscious of and if you're someone, health. And if you live in a country that has universal health care, such as the UK, or you are someone who advocates for it somewhere where, you know, it's not, totally there like in the usa then actually you should also be beating this this same drum um i saw the other day i can't oh gosh i don't can't remember the number but how many billions of pounds that obesity costs the nhs every year right and like you know that is that is avoidable right if people did take that personal responsibility just to you know not get gigantically overweight then you know actually do it for yourself of course do it for yourself do it for your family but for the wider society, in the UK anyway, you can't, people can't even make that excuse that, oh, it has no impact on other people because it literally, it, it quite literally actually does. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that's a, that's a whole nother road we can go down. Yo, Jerry, yeah, yeah. it's been awesome talking to you, man. I know we can, uh, we can talk forever. I'll definitely have you back on the podcast in the future. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. I think the workout advice and nutrition advice that you've put out here is really going to help a lot of people, especially at this time. And uh, yeah, man. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it, Zuby. Thank you, man.